Well, that's a few minutes after three UK time for those who are joining us from further afield. And so I think we'll make a start. So um, welcome to this inclusive growth community practice event. I'm Robert Pollock and I'm going to be chairing this event. Um, I'm an EDAS board member. Um, as you may know, EDAS has funding and support from the Scottish Government uh, to establish this inclusive growth community of practice. And it has been running now for two years and it's covered a wide range of issues, including community wealth building, place-based regeneration, and regional economic partnerships. And today, I'm delighted that you've joined us uh, in this reconvened community of practice. And we have over 80 participants uh, from national government, from local government, from public agencies, the third sector, academia, and think tanks. So we have a, a great cross section of the Scottish economic development community joining us today. And that really should be the spirit of a community of practice, diverse voices and diverse opinions. And today's community of practice focuses on the possibilities and practicalities of further adopting well-being economy principles and approaches within the Scottish economic development community. So an exciting agenda today, but more specifically, there is very much a, a clear purpose for today. We would like your views, your insights, and your opinions on the development of a well-being economy policy design guidebook that can be used by economic development practitioners. A guidebook that can be used by practitioners and policymakers in <laughs> Scotland, but also in other economic development communities around the world. So in order to progress our discussion and our consideration today, we will firstly have a panel discussion with three excellent co contributors to frame our thinking. And then we'll move into working groups. And these working groups, there'll be four and they'll be facilitated. And one of our, Amanda will be telling you a little more about the working groups later. And these working groups will allow us to focus on the development of this policy design guidebook that I spoke of for jet creating a well-being economy. And as I said, you'll be allotted to four groups, automatically allotted to four groups, working groups. We will then spend some time feeding back the key messages from those working groups on how we can make this handbook as practical and valuable as possible. And then there'll be a short summing up. And I, I'm confident that we can wrap this up by about 4.25. So please bear with us. Just before handing over to the panel, though, I'd like to make some just a few introductory observations. I think we're all aware that we are currently finding ourselves at a fork in the road when it comes to economic development. And that fork in the road has very much been facilitated or caused by COVID-19. So one path forward is to attempt to revert to the past and rebuild the economy as it, as it manifested itself or as it was prior to March of this year. An alternative path for the economic development community is to follow an economic development agenda that is less familiar, one that makes people and planet its primary reference points. But possibly it'll be a combination of both, a reversion to old ways of working, but also new ways of working. No one can confidently predict the future. However, I am confident, and I think many of us in the economic development community are aware, if we are to take a more innovative path, a more a path of economic development that is more informed by the principles of a well-being economy, we need new tools, we need new methods, and we need, need new policies for working. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. One other observation is um, the dynamic lexicon of economic development. I, I've, I've now been working in economic development for three decades. And I always think it's shocking when you have to describe your career in decades and not years. But I've been working in economic development now for three decades. And I'm conscious in recent, recent years, there have been new phrases introduced to the economic development community. 
We talk about inclusive growth. We talk about community wealth building. We talk about social inclusion. We talk about regional economic par partnerships. And today we're talking about the well-being economy. And I'm confident that we, at the end of today, will have a much better feel for how well-being economy principles and approaches can inform our economic development agenda. But I'd like us always to bear that in mind, that we always have to cl have clarity on how different approaches can complement and integrate. Right, I think we'll now move on to, to the panel discussion. Now, one of the things I do want to stress about today is, as ever, it's an EDAS event, it's a community of practice event. So let's be open, let's be candid in, our, in, our, in sharing our thoughts and our experiences, and it is very much about sharing. So I'm delighted to introduce the panel that will frame our working group discussions. Firstly, we have Gary Gillespie, and as many of us know, Gary is the Chief Economic Advisor at the Scottish Government, a position he's held for uh, two decades. Um, and Gary is very much a well-kent face in the Scottish economic development community. We will then, and Gary will be talking about how the wellbeing economy agenda fits with the broader economic development approach. And we'll also be giving insights into the wellbeing economy government partnership, which uh, the Scottish government is part of, along with some other national governments. Second contributor will be Dr. Gemma uh, Bone Dodds. And Gemma is a board trustee of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Scotland. Now, Gemma is a um, political economist and is very much a systems change expert. But I, I must stress, she has not only got that theoretical perspective or academic perspective, she has practical insight and experience of rural and urban development, both in England and Scotland. And Gemma will be talking about what do we mean by a well-being economy? What are the characteristics of a well-being economy? And how can we achieve it? And finally, um, the floor goes to Amanda Janu. And Ma Amanda is the knowledge and policy lead for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And Amanda is joining us from Vermont, so she's five hours behind. Uh, so it's still morning uh, where she is. Um, um, Amanda has a background in international development and is, she has been taking the lead on developing the, the policy uh, guidebook, the policy design guidebook. And so she'll be setting the scene for how the policy design guidebook has evolved and also looking, explaining how she would like your thoughts and contributions and insights during the, during the working groups that we'll break into. So I've said enough, so I'm not going to hand over to the panel. And first up is Gary Gillespie. Okay, thanks very much, Robert. It's a pleasure to participate in the panel and I think you have asked me to kick off and cover essentially uh, well-being economy governments and Scotland's well-being economy goals so big topics in kind of five six minutes but so I'll do them and I'll do them at pace both are obviously linked uh, but I'll start with well-being and then I'll talk about I think I agree entirely with you in a sense about the kind of evolution of approach and what it means for economic development and obviously for practitioners. So for me, starting wellbeing is a broader concept, obviously. And I think it builds on this notion that you require a more systemic or system-wide approach to policy outcomes. And in a sense, we've had that in Scotland for a period with the National Performance Framework, uh, starting in 2007, updated in 2018. Uh, for those that, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the NPF around the uh, a living outcomes and it kind of forces you to to measure a wider basket of indicators and essentially recognize the interlinkage of uh, outcomes whether it's health education justice economy environment but what i want to flag is in a sense the 2018 update essentially put well-being at the heart of the government's purpose around creating a, a more successful country with opportunities for all to flourish through increased well-being and that was the addition of well-being and sustainable and inclusive growth. And it also has a bit around the type of society that we want to be in terms of how we treat people, kidni sorry, kid kindness, dignity, and the rule of law. So that's very quickly what essentially well-being is. 
from an economic perspective, uh, what was interesting when the NPF was updated in 2018, the, the First Minister spoke at the conference. And if you're interested, also she has an excellent, um, an excellent, God, what's it called? No, YouTube. Um, I'll come back to it. <laughs> She's an excellent, I um, forgot what the term is for those uh, where you do a nine minute uh, kind of YouTube Ted talk. blog. TED Talk, that's it exactly. Thank you very much. She's an excellent TED Talk on what, how she came to well-being in that context. But essentially when she was describing the NPF launch, she talked about uh, economic growth as being a means to an end and not important in its own right. Being important only in the sense that it improved the, the quality of life for people, the opportunities, and didn't come at a, a cost to the environment or wider society. So that was very much the framing of that and for me well-being really brings together societal economic and environmental concerns into one framework and recognizes the interlinkage and how you manage the tensions and stuff but what's again i think so i'll say a little bit more about how we got to well-being but what's really interesting i suppose when you think how we're living through covid19 uh it's really essentially hit an economy with pre-existing challenges and it's also impacting our well-being if you think about the challenges around inequality changing labor market the need to transition to net zero the aftermath of the financial crisis and probably the lack of resilience in a lot of our systems which have been exposed by but by the by the pandemic or whatever it's also the pandemic's also changing essentially um how how, how we live at the moment what we value and measure, uh, people's preferences, behaviours and markets have changed in a really, really short period of time, which will have implications for us in terms of economic development. It's also questioning, it led to people questioning essentially how we distribute resources and what we value in the economy, the whole debate about key workers, what's important. And this notion of kind of collective, collective well-being and what it, what it essentially means. So, so there's a lot in that, and I think as Robert mentioned, we have a lexicon that changes all the time in um, economic development. I worked in uh, regional policy in the 1990s, and that was a whole different terminology then. But essentially, it was all about achieving a, a more equ equitable type of uh, outcome for places and people. And I think, in a sense, if you look at what we're doing now with inclusive growth agenda and how that's moving on to a broader well-being setting. But let me say a little bit about um, that agenda and how where we are now in that in that context. So for me, the, the well-being economy agenda and from, an, from the economic perspective really builds on the inclusive growth work that we, we set about and that we've been doing now for the last... Uh, three or four years and essentially that that link is also how the well-being economy governments actually started to come about so if i look if i think back to uh 2017 we had a conference in glasgow inclusive growth conference where we had participants from a range of countries who wanted to come and look at this type of framing for an economic response and in the margins of that meeting, we had a broader discussion about what a broader well-being uh, framing could look like and how that would change your approach. And from then, and essentially to me, it's, it really builds on a stronger environmental element within both inclusion and kind of economic competitiveness kind of growth elements. But from then, we launched the Wellbeing Economy governments with uh, Iceland and New Zealand, an OECD event in South Korea in 2018. And essentially the focus of that group is really about collaborating, collaborating to share best practice, really to address the challenges that we're facing as a government to government group. And it's really about kind of sharing our commonalities. So let me just say a little bit about the group. So we have obviously New Zealand, Iceland, uh, we've since been joined by Wales as a formal member, and we also have Finland and Canada participating in the discussions as well. The inclusion of Finland is really interesting because during their presidency of the EU, they led a programme of work around the economy of wellbeing, which they seen as something that the EU countries should be looking to 
thinking about how you you reprioritise uh, within economies and across the EU. And actually their recommendations were around uh, broad themes, education, social protection, equality, healthcare, health and safety at work. So really quite quite broad broad themes in that context. What we so as I mentioned, we've been participating um, with these countries and the way we do it is through essentially policy labs where we each country has essentially a commitment to wellbeing as a performance framework. And essentially we've been sharing how we've been dealing more recently with the COVID and the pandemic and how that has impacted on wellbeing in each country and how our, our response to that um, has encapsulated or dealt with the, the impacts on kind of broader wellbeing. So again, thinking about wellbeing, economic, social, environmental. If you think about even the Scottish Government's response to the route map and how we are uh, dealing with the pandemic, the First Minister often talks about four harms, the immediate uh, health harm of the pandemic, the wider health harm in terms of the wider impacts on people's health, the societal impact of people through the conditions that they're having to live through, the loss of school education, and the fourth harm around the economy. So that whole holistic approach really is framed is framed within that. We're in the midst of having our the second of our three immediate policy labs where countries come and present how they are dealing with the with the pandemic. We had one last week on the labour market. We heard from New Zealand and Wales. Uh, where the next one we're hearing from Iceland about the impact of the pandemic on their well-being. So I think to take it back to a more practical uh, sense and start to wind up, given I've, I've only got five or six minutes, uh, most of the countries have a measurement framework. So you've got to have a kind of definition of what what is the broader well-being. Again, people have mentioned people, planet, uh, dif different aspects of that. So you've got to have that framing in place and you can then from then you can look at how your policies and choices impact on that framing both at a national level and a local level so new zealand obviously did a well-being budget where they looked at, at providing additional resource to areas that showed the greatest impact on well-being across government portfolios but let me finish just uh, for the a kind of practitioner point of view so for me, wellbeing has a massively strong place to mention. I think it builds on the kind of strong work that's been done on inclusive growth has been very much a kind of place-based uh, bottom-up approach. Robert mentioned community wealth building, inclusive growth work. So the, if you think about how we, how practitioners operationalise inclusive growth through the inclusive growth diagnostic, looking at the constraints within areas, in some senses, the wellbeing economy at a practical level is really builds on that and what we are doing is we're developing the wellbeing economy monitor we're, we're working with local authorities to look at to pilot that and look how that will operate within particular areas and then essentially what the key challenge for this is how you manage the transition or the the, the tensions and synergies that come up between social economic and environmental. And the final thing, just I appreciate there's a lot in that and it's been very quick, is in a sense, is one thing that's really key is the resilience of systems. So we'll probably hear more about systems within this and taking a system wide approach, but it's something about getting that, getting the interaction of uh, systems and understanding that. But finally, the, the pandemic has really driven interest in this kind of broader approach. Um, and I think that's that's really important. But from a, I think from most of the pr practitioners on EDAS and stuff, it's really thinking about what would that broader wellbeing perspective bring to how you do your policy decisions today, economic development. And I think it's really bringing in that environmental element alongside the societal and the economic. But I'll stop there, Robert, and uh, hopefully that's gave people a flavour of the priorities and work that's going on. Thanks, Gary. That was very useful context about the positioning of well-being and the well-being economy approach within the Scottish policy agenda. I'm conscious of time, so I'll hand over to Dr. Gemma Bone-Dodds, I said, is 
a board trustee of Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Scotland. So Gemma, please, you, you have the floor. Great, right. thanks very much. Um, and thank you, Edas, for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, we've heard quite a lot already just from, um, from Robert and Gary there, um, but I thought I would just focus in on what a wellbeing economy um, is um, in a little bit more detail, um, but also what I think that that means for policymakers. Um, I am um, having work in, and currently still working in economic development myself. Um, I have some ideas at least where the sticking points come for me. Um, so first, so I am a trustee of Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Scotland, so where Amanda, who you're going to hear from next, she works for the global team. Um, we All Global has also a series of country hubs um, and We All Scotland is one of those um, and we exist, so we're a charity and we exist to progress the aims um, and the principles and the vision of a well-being economy in Scotland and really working with our partners and um, working with what we call our ally organisations um, to help support them and support all the good work that's that's already happening that's getting us closer each and every day to a well-being economy and um, we exist really to support amplify connect up um, that side of things so um, I'll come back to that a little bit later, um, but what what is a wellbeing economy? So we our current system, and you know, we've heard from Gary there, and I think you know you can't probably put it better than Nicola does in her TED talk. Um, but essentially, it's really a system whereby the economy is seen as a tool in which we can create well-being and prosperity for both people and planet. Um, so one phrase that we like to use um, to sum wellbeing economy up in one sentence is um, it's about having a, an economy that delivers social justice on a healthy planet. Um, and that really is at the core and the heart of what we do. Um, what does that mean? It means that um, our economy and the economic policy we use is explicitly designed to enable that to happen. Um, and um what does that what does that mean for policymakers? Well, it means that um, we need to have an orientation to systems change. So the situation that we're currently in um, is one, I think, of a converging crises, a series of converging crises. Um, COVID is making a lot of these things a lot worse, a lot more acute. It's um, accelerating the trends that were already there in the economy. Um, but essentially, I think there's four main converging crises, which is the social, um, a social crisis. So inequality is rampant, both within and between regions um, and nations. Um, and this leads into political crisis. So um, I think that we can see that the fact that people feel so pulled apart from the decisions that matter to them in their lives. And I think that's largely because for a long time, economics and the economy has been held as something that's almost slightly outside of the political realm. Um, don't worry, we're just doing the numbers like this is what will happen. And it's been a little bit patriarchal, like in that in that sort of sense, quite top down. And people have felt really disconnected um, from those things. And I think that, you know, that the outcomes of that are things like the rise of nationalism across the world um, and people wanting to, you know, take back control. And I think that that has something to do with it. We have a huge, huge economic challenge um, that we're going into. So this is going to be the biggest recession, um, you know, that anybody has, and any of us will have seen in our in our lifetimes. And it's going to be a global one. Like it's it's not like the last recession where some areas didn't suffer from it as badly. This is this is being you know experienced right across the globe. Um, and of course, we have the environmental crisis. So the climate change and biodiversity crisis is absolutely huge. Um, and it is there is there is no recovery plans that can't take that into account. Otherwise, we're not um, taking, you know, a realistic view of what we need to do and the challenges that we have. So each of these crises play into the other. And so this is what we what I mean and what we mean when we talk about uh, we need to tackle the economy in, in a systemic way. It's by looking at the intersection of the social, economic, political and environmental crises. So 
systemic crises need systemic solutions. Um, there's a great blog by Jen Wallace um, of the Carnegie Trust um, uh, just from the last couple of months where she's looking at the concept of super policies. So when we start to think of like, um, you know, because saying that there's converging crises and we need to think in systems is fine, but that's very big and daunting and challenging. And it, and it just seems like we're making, you know, the job of economic development professionals everywhere just more and more complicated. And in a sense, we are. Um, but there's also the possibility of um, doing what she talks about in her blog, which is about um, looking for those super policies. So it could be a way to help us find a way out of this crisis by where are the policies that hit across a number of different um, uh, areas that don't have any spill on bad effects on other areas, but that can that can kind of do that really well. So examples are, you know, investing in, say, um, uh, retrofitting tenement buildings in Scotland. Well, you create jobs. You might even, if you're if you're lucky, create some um, local cooperative um, businesses who 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 own the means to to, to do up the the properties in the local area, you create um, better health outcomes because the people people who live there will no longer be living in cold homes. They will be more economically res resilient um, because they will be spending less money on, um, on their uh, heating bills. Um, and we will affect climate change and we will make an impact on that. So that's the kind of idea of some of the exciting things that can happen. But the reason that why we're here today is not to talk to you about here's a set of policies, here's a suite of policies that we can do. Um, because I think the three things, um, which I'm going to get through in the next um, 30 seconds, um, is um, policymakers, I think, need to have an orientation to systems change. Um, they need to have greater courage um, and welcome uncertainty and innovation. I think what Gary just said there about um, there is a resilience in systems, I think that's very true. So I think the Scottish Government have done so much to welcome and take steps forward for the well-being, you know, um, for the well-being economy. Um, and, and, and really, and I think that there is a real deep understanding of that, but there is still resilience from the existing systems who will be pushing to make it go back to normal. Um, and that's expected um, and you wouldn't, you know, so we have to have courage to welcome uncertainty and have innovation to do new things. And then finally, to work in this kind of complexity and chaos, um, you have to be able to reach out and pull from a much wider and diverse range of audiences. So for policymakers, that means pulling that in up front. So policymakers don't have the answers. I'm so sorry, everyone on the call, but I'm sure you know this already. Um, but you know, we don't have all the answers, but we have the ability to reach out and connect and collaborate with more people who do collectively have those answers. And so that is very much where the policy guidebook has been coming from. Um, it's about supporting um, and understanding that there's this gap. So um, Leslie Martin on the chat just before, just this is the final point, said it exactly. So Leslie, well done, you've got this just from that first little introduction. She said, all visions and principles end up on someone's desk. So what will people do differently and how will they work? So the, po the policy making guide is here to support that and to help all of you who are working in this difficult area. You get a brief, it drops on your desk. Okay, well, what do we do? We've only got access to the same old tools that we've always had. So this is what it's about. So I'll hand over to uh, Amanda who will tell you a bit more in detail of that, but I think that gives you a flavor of, of where we're coming from. And you can follow We All Scotland on Twitter to find out what we're gonna be doing next and reach out to us if you need anything. So thanks. Well, excellent. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much to EDAS for having this event and for everybody for attending and taking the time. Um, so I, I, Robert mentioned, but I joined the Wellbeing Economy Alliance um, coming from the international development space. And so I'd been working as an economic policy advisor for about a decade for the UN. And in this role, one of the things I saw all of the time was that governments were continuously told to take this hands-off approach to the economy and to trust that if they just promoted GDP, that everything else would just sort itself out. Um, but it, in my role, one of the most powerful exercises I had was when I would ask policymakers what they really actually wanted to achieve with their economic policies. 
Um, and in Ukraine, it was peace. And in Myanmar, it was rural urban inequality reduction, or in Mozambique, it was resilience. And these different goals required really different economic strategies, because in order to build a resilient economy, for example, you don't want to follow the standard growth strategy of just promoting textiles, for example, um, and specializing in this and growing that sector as fast as possible because it makes you really vulnerable to shocks. So these kind of considerations were what brought me to the well-being economy movement because here was a community, a global community of people who all recognizes that we needed a little bit more clarity on the purpose of the economy and really believe that the purpose should be to promote human and ecological well-being. And so I thought, Yes, great, that sounds fantastic. Um, but how do we get there? And so this is what the policy design guide is trying to begin to answer. Um, it aims to outline how policymakers um, can work to build a well being economy in a way that differs from standard economic policy approaches and to sort of provide some practical tools, literature, um, and examples and case studies um, that can support policymakers who want to build a more just and sustainable economy, but aren't really sure where to start or how to go about doing that. Now, I should be honest with you that this is not a very easy task because, first of all, the well being economy movement is young. And so the path and the processes have are not all there yet. They haven't all been proven. And so we are, we are at the beginning of this journey um, and a lot of the solutions and ideas have yet to be developed. And secondly, the major challenge is because a well-being economy in Mozambique is going to look different than it will here in Scotland, for example, because it will be a reflection of your society's unique culture and context and values and objectives. So I don't have a ton of time to get into a lot of detail regarding um, the policy design guide, but I wanted to just speak to a couple of the principles and give you some examples of a few of the kind of processes that we would like to explore in this guide um, so you can get a flavor before we move into our discussion groups. But one of the core principles, as Gemma said, for us is really about participation. So, Obviously, um, a lot of people, I think, are feeling very disempowered at the moment, especially when it comes to the economy. And that we've kind of lost sight that we are the economy um, somehow along the way, and we tend to view it as something very powerful and abstract, rather than just recognizing that it's a word that we use to express the ways in which we provide for one another. And the ways that we produce and provide things for one another have a really big impact on our collective well-being. So this guide begins by exploring, for example, different ways that policymakers can understand their community's well-being priorities and goals. Um, with Scotland's well-being framework, for example, that Gary mentioned being a really, really great case study and example to feature in this guide because your government went out and spoke to people and in this process was able to identify some really beautiful goals like ensuring that all children grow up feeling loved safe and respected. So by engaging with people from the beginning of this process, um, you've already begun that process of developing a well-being economy because it is as much about the journey as it is the destination. Because it's about changing the way that we engage and understand and manage the economy um, so that we can empower people to really be a part of this process of building the better world um, we envision. And so once that you have this clarity, as Scotland does with your well-being framework, on um, what your community's goals are, what the real um, orientation and indicators of success will be in moving forward, it's about then moving to that next step of identifying what kinds of economic activities and behaviors are actually in line with those goals. So for example, you know, you might think that supporting household care work is really important for children's well-being and then but then the reality is right and this is the hard thing for any policymaker is that there's always going to be trade-offs right so if you promote more household care work how might that come um, at the disadvantage 
you might have. And so this is where strategy comes in um, in trying to figure out how to best manage and minimize tensions between different objectives as you work towards achieving your goals. So policy ultimately is then how you manage these tensions and how you bring your strategy to life. So policy plays a really powerful role in the economy because it sets the rules of the game. It says what's fair and just and legitimate sort of economic action. And it ultimately acts to foster and support certain kinds of behaviors um, relative to others, right? Through incentives or tax schemes, things like this. So a pretty universal problem I've seen um, in my work is that policymakers generally tend to develop new policies without really considering what's already in place. And so every government um, I've been to generally has a whole suite of policies that collectively are working to encourage particular kinds of behavior. And for a very long time, economic policies have been oriented towards promoting the kinds of behaviors that boost growth. And as you move beyond that singular objective, then you will need to look at how you might need to adapt and realign some of these policies so that they're in line with a, a wider range of goals um, that really connect with your community's well-being um, values and objectives. So, in this way, policy making we recognize as both an art and a science. Um, it is about empowering people and stakeholders to be agents of change in their communities. It sometimes requires taking a step forward and sometimes requires taking a step back, but it always requires bringing people along the way with you on this journey. So by engaging communities and stakeholders, throughout these processes of strategy design and policy assessment and selection, you're not only able to better find really innovative solutions and ideas, but also to manage these trade-offs and importantly, ensure that everyone has clarity on what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, and this is one of the major things that I've seen can really undermine effective implementation. When people are in charge of implementing policies or programs that they didn't have a part in developing and they're not clear on the logic of. And so meaningful participation, as you can sort of hear, is, um, is one of the key principles for this guide, but it's also a key principle of how we're trying to develop this guide. So we've been co-creating this guide with the We All membership, like our community, and you'll be able to meet some of brilliant members um, in your working groups who will help to facilitate our discussions. Um, but we also really wanted to get out and to really hear from as many different policymakers, experts, community um, members about their ideas and perspectives that can help to inform the structure and the content of this guide as well. So, um, the, for this reason, we have tried to create as much time as possible for working group discussions so that we can explore some of the types of language, content, or ideas um, that you might have that you think could feature in this guide. And because we're ultimately aware that this guide is not going to be able to answer all of the challenges that policymakers face, um, but we hope that it can be a source of inspiration and support on the journey. Because I've met so many policymakers around the world who are really inspiring and they really care and they want to stop putting band-aids on the wounds that are being created by our current system right and so people who really want to build inclusive and sustainable economies but they feel unsure exactly about how to go about this and so this guidebook is for them um, but it's also for us because a well-being economy will require all of us to be engaged in this movement um, because we have to embrace really new ideas and thinking um, and solutions. And so I, I'm just very grateful to have this opportunity um, to be able to hear your ideas, um, to be able to, to speak with some of you, but to be able to, to get notes and get feedback from, from the other groups as well. So with that, um, I will sort of hand it over um, and say that we're gonna be breaking into four working groups and that these um, working groups will be sort of facilitated by members of EDAS and also the We All community. And we'll be exploring some different questions um, regarding what kind of 
vision you would have for a well-being economy, what kind of challenges you see in achieving this, the role of policy, and any tools or resources or information that you might be able to provide to us um, that could help to inform the ultimate shape and form of this guide. Um, and after we have our discussions, then we'll come back and we'll, we'll hear from each of the groups about what they've discussed. And then ultimately we'll wrap it up. And I hope that I'll be able to, to work with each of you more in the future um, and provide some opportunities for your future engagement in this process. Amanda, Amanda, mm -hmm. thank you so much for that overview of the process. Now there's obviously a real appetite uh, for discussion and input because the chat really is going, you know, like a steam train. So let's go into our groups now, but can I suggest that we do still reconvene at approximately 10 past four and we'll keep the feedback to the minimum and the wrap up to a minimum. But I think it's important that we still have nearly half an hour. So let's uh, reconvene, go into our groups and reconvene been just after 10 past four. So you'll be now divided up, scattered to the four winds. So I'm now opening the rooms. You will have a notification on your screen to say join room. These have been allocated at random. Okay, I think it looks like most of us are back in, in the main meeting room. So um, I, I have to confess now, the reason I'm asked to be a chair is not because I'm a good chair. It's just because I'm a disciplined timekeeper. So uh, we're, we're running slightly behind. So can I suggest that uh, we have feedback from each of the four groups, but we hold feedback to no more than two, two and a half minutes per group. It's unfair because the discussion was rich, but hey, we've got other things to, to be getting on with today, I'm sure. So could I start with um, work group one with Emma uh, to give her two to three minutes of feedback? Thank you. Oh, sorry, I thought you said Emma. I was like, oh, that's not me. Sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the notes, just um, making my things. Sorry. Yes. So, um, yeah, we had some fantastic discussions in our group. So um, we talked about um, fast forwarding 10 years and there were sort of three main points um, that really came up there. So the first one was... Um, in 10 years time, we would be um, measuring what we value and valuing what we measure. So making sure that we're going past just mere numbers and that numbers are not the only, um, you know, the abstract numbers are not the only thing that, that it is and, and having really like a, a person or a client centered approach um, that was particularly for, for, for job creation and employability. Um, there was a feeling that we wouldn't, we would no longer be swimming against the stream so that we, you know, the, 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 the whole system and I guess the culture and the approaches are not ones that we're constantly button heads against when we're trying to do good work. So I think that's really, um, you know, an illustrative point. And then we had a great discussion about timelines. So thinking about, oh, 10 years is it's not possible in 10 years, but then also discussions, but this crisis is, 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 is very, very large and it, um, the amount of money that's going to be poured into economic change is going to be huge. And if we can actually harness that in such a way that all a, that, that is being directed all towards a well-being economy, you know, we're not giving bailouts to businesses who are located in tax havens. We're not, you know, if we're doing all of those things, um, then that's great. And then finally, there was a really brilliant bit in the in, in the last um, thing where we're talking about the knee, the, the national performance framework and talking about how it it's there and it's got a narrative and it's got a direction of travel and it was made using a participatory process. But there is a real issue that it's it hasn't gone any further than that. So there was a feeling that it's not used across the Scottish government um, to drive um, change and that people who want to use the NPF like from the outside it's not clear to them exactly how they can use those measurements going forward and whether pe people should be spending the time trying to work out how to do it. And actually that's the next stage for the Scottish government to do. But we also had Angelica who works um, in NPF and she very much recognized that in terms of the policy guidebook process, 
they've gone through the vision and the strategy and then onto that implementation stage. So um, I personally think that in that, possibly with the EDAS or with We All or the Scottish Government, whatever, there would be a real opportunity to test out the that third stage of the of the policy guidebook. Um, there in in that thing how can we make this work how can we really operationalize it to um catalyze that all the change that's kind of waiting i guess to be born there um i, I did want to say one other thing is that I've, I've said to our group that we'll ask on here if anybody wants to be involved um or read any future drafts or or be involved um in the guide because it gets further along the process and um, so i didn't capture that in my group but um i guess if people want to put their names in the chat then that would that would be helpful for a and the team doing it. So that's me. Thank you, Gemma, for that very uh, disciplined feedback and very accurate feedback as well. So let's now move over to work group two uh, for feedback. That could be Amanda or Jacob. Ah, okay, I was wondering which one is... Perfect, good. that's fine. Maybe Robert doesn't know the numbers. <laughs> All right, okay. So, uh, hi, my name is Jakob Hafler, and um, I'm German, so I get asked a lot to take care of the time too, so I'm going to try to make this uh, really brief. Um, so, um, we talked also about uh, this fast forward 10 years uh, question a lot, and I think the one topic um, that everything kind of evolved around was empowerment. So people really talked a lot about how to empower people and give them control of the goods and services they consume and they use and how to make people really feel empowered and how to um, achieve um, greater, greater integration and how to actually let people do what they are passionate about in the economy rather than just making any job that they have to do um, to survive. So I think that was the one core, core thing um, that everything evolved around. And then the second very important thing that has been talked about was cooperation. So um, especially the cooperation in terms of um, institutional cooperation between different institutions. And I think uh, many people emphasize that the COVID-19 recovery situation actually provided some kind of a window of opportunity and also good um, good experiences where different organizations actually came together and they work together much more cooperated much better than they did before and um, the people in our group saw that as a good chance to actually um, enhance their cooperation which would result in better um, well intergovernmental coordination and better coordinated policies and the last thing um, that was uh, raised I think um, was that um, it should be redefined what economic activity actually is. Okay, so right now we understand economic activity um, a lot as stuff that actually contributes to GDP growth, but we should, in order to transition to well-being economy, we should really redefine that and also uh, think of um, terms like care or volunteer work or economic activities that actually contribute um, to health of the people as as core economic activities for our new well-being economies. Um, and then I don't know if I've missed something crucial. Um, maybe you can add to that. Apparently not. <laughs> Thank you, Jakob. Um, can we now have feedback from, I think we'll go with, um, why not working group three? That would be the, the sensible, well, the Andre Andrea or Malin? Yes. Um, so we had a wonderful discussion. Uh, we talked about some vocabulary and words for search engine optimization uh, aspect needs for the guidebook. And um, people talked about health, happiness, fairness, social justice, uh, social currency was another theme that came forward. Um, and we talked about challenges that have been overcome when we fast forward 10 years um, envisioning what a well-being economy looks like and uh, folks have weighed in saying that policymakers and community and business folks are working more together um, and 
there is mainstreaming of concepts of equity within both politicians and policymakers. Conversations are different. We're talking to business in their language instead of business not being a part of the discussion. Um, and we're also redefining, we have a new language. If we're fast forwarding 10 years, new language to um, be inclusive of those things that reflect well being economy. Very exciting to me is that we got some wonderful case examples and models to point to, which is really important. So if anybody has models or cases that or resources we can point to that would inform the guidebook, that would be fantastic. You could drop it in the chat. And again, if anybody wants to help weigh in on this process, you can also put your name in the chat. It was a fantastic discussion. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, by the powers of deduction, I'm assuming it's now Amanda to give the feedback uh, for the fourth and final work group. And Amanda, it may be useful if you also use the opportunity just at the end of your feedback, also just to summarize the next steps in terms of this process. And then I'll say a few words of, of conclusion. It could be Andrew or Michael as well for I think it's, yeah, I think it's us, um, Robert. Okay. Oh, apologies. Sorry, I'm oh, the one with the numbers. Amanda, I think Amanda was with Jacob, but uh, okay. anyway, yeah, shall I go ahead for group four? Yeah, okay, great. So, um, yeah, we had a really interesting conversation, eh? I mean, people from all different areas of work. Um, we tackled three questions. Um, one, which was very much a sort of straight out, you know, what's your, what do you think about when you think about wellbeing economic policy? And there was a lot of words related to sort of the provision for all. It was interesting when thinking back to how Amanda had sort of talked about her experiences in different international development settings, how sort of what, what, what should be the purpose of the economy? And um, there was a lot around, you know, fairness, equality, um, inclusiveness as well um interestingly the word productivity came up which i think was in was well repurposed because productivity is often thought about in terms of how can it add to economic growth but in this instance it was referred to in terms of how can government be productive in its use of resources to achieve um, the goals so how do we spend money uh, to support well-being uh, economy goals if you like we also had a really really good i think uh, contributions in terms of fast forwarding to 2030 and and what what might uh sort of uh the situation look like if we were to be closer to a well-being economy and 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 sort of really flipping around the situation in terms of businesses where it's it's kind of easier to do business in the right way so almost a social enterprise model or something similar rather than the sort of de facto business as usual model. So, you know, that had actually turned itself around, but also really good contributions in terms of how the delivery of goods and services um, were broader in the way that the there was ownership uh, in forms that were not simply the traditional public or private provision of services, but perhaps there's a community element in there as well. Community government was also um, discussed and suggested as a fantastic, uh, perhaps, change that we might see in the way that local government uh, decisions are made um, in a decade's time, if you like. Um, there were other contributions as well, but I'm sort of conscious of time. So I'll just sort of zoom forward to the final question that we explored, which was around thinking about what's actually taking place in your location at the moment that might be of interest and relevance in building the case for the support for a wellbeing economy. And, and um, in this case, uh, there was a contribution where Dundee uh, and the work with anchor institutions to promote a real living wage, and this was sort of painted as a, an effective partnership, including with the private sector, to push this forward. And, and living wage, absolutely real living wage, is, is very much aligned to uh, a well-being uh, economy. Um, also, some interesting conversations about community wealth building and where perhaps it should start, depending on the capacity of local communities. Um, and perhaps the starting point should be those communities that are, have, have less sort of capacities um, is where the, the, the benefit and the value, you know, if we are to start that process somewhere, we should focus there uh, as opposed to communities that perhaps um, have more resources already uh, in place. So I'd say that's hopefully uh, uh, some sort of a, a just uh, sort of a, a summary, if you like, of, uh, of group four's conversation. 
excellent summing up, Michael. I'm so glad we came to you. Um, so it's now over to Amanda. And if Amanda could say a few words on the next steps for we all, and then we can move to, to, to wrapping up. So Amanda, over to you. Yes, thanks so much, Robert. Um, yeah, wow. So I just wanna thank everybody, um, this community of people, the experience here and the perspectives and the ideas um, are fantastic. And, and so I'm really looking forward to going into all of the notes as well and using it to really inform um, the guidebook as we, as we continue on. So just to give you a sense, our plan is to try to uh, publish this guide by the end of this year. So in the coming months, we're still getting, trying to gather tools and case studies and resources that can sort of feature in the guide. So if you have any good tools or resources, you can let us know. Or I've already seen very kind offers by many of you to potentially review or to input into this process. And so, um, yeah, that would be amazing. So we'll, we can send you out a draft when we have it and get some of your feedback and ideas and additional inputs that you think might be missing. And finally, we're also trying to sort of build within We All itself more of our, our policy network. Um, so if you're interested in engaging in, in We All or also in our knowledge and policy work more broadly, um, I'd really love to have you. So please reach out, um, join as an individual or as an organization to We All. Um, also, as Gemma said, there's We All Scotland too. So there's a lot of different opportunities here to do things at the local or the international level, depending on your interest. Um, and yeah, so with that, I know we don't have much more time, but I just really, really wanna thank you um, for taking the time to, to speak about this. And, and I really look forward to working with you all more in the future. Thank you, Amanda. Um, it was a very rich discussion. Uh, I have to say, uh, what really impressed me in my work group was people were not talking about the concept, they were talking about how we implement the principles. And that really struck me. So people were more interested in the how rather than what is this? So that's very good. Um, and a very good starting point. For me, a number of things recurred throughout the discussions, and I think it was evident throughout the, the, the feedback. One is timing. We're used to accepting change that is intergenerational, that can be measured in decades. And there is a real sense that there is an opportunity for accelerating this agenda and accelerating it markedly. The second thing is scale. Interestingly, a number of people said, this can't be a cottage industry. And this is right. If it's, if it's about fundamentally changing society, this can't be about a, a small number of pilots. It has to be something of scale. But we have to marry the bottom-up approaches of community building, in, very much embodied within the spirit of the discussion today. But we also have to link that to the, the top-down drivers of economic advancement. And that is issues around internationalization and finding industries that are decarbonized but competitive in international markets. So there's something around timing, scale and positioning. But the thing which came up in our group by many people was the need for political courage. Nobody said courage, but it came up earlier by everybody was talking about politics having to seize this moment. And the NMA, NPF is a starting point, but we do need to build on it and to actually think through how do we not only set goals and measure those goals, but how do we achieve those goals, the how. And I think the handbook is going to be incredibly valuable in that regard. And I think its currency is, is proven by the amount of people who have actually volunteered to be involved in the development of the handbook. So this has been a, a very, very useful uh, discussion for EDAS, I think for hopefully we all, and for the community of practice. So that just leaves me to, to, to thank you all for your contributions. I, I found it immensely rich and I was struck by a wide degree of consensus across many different types of actors in the economic development community. So it's nearly half past, so I would just like to give my thanks to our We All colleagues who were a magnificent team today, uh, who really motored this agenda forward. Uh, I would obviously like to thank the Scottish Government for funding the community practice and, and for supporting EDAS in this uh, policy environment. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank you, the participants, for your, your generosity 
in your thoughts and um, your views. So I think we'll leave it there. I won't do the usual EDAS plug about what's coming up in the future because I think we've reached our time, but you should all be receiving emails, giving you updates on the CPD courses, the COVID conversations that we're having. So please do get involved. So thanks very much. Stay safe.